All right, Luke chapter 15 and verse, let me read verses 3 to 6 and then we're going to go over to John a little bit further to the right and get kind of a confirming word out of, out of John chapter 6. And let me just get over to John 6 so I can hit it quick. All right, Luke chapter 15, let me start with verse 3. So Jesus spoke this parable to them and said, now you understand what a parable is? A parable is always a story from the natural that has spiritual application. That's what a parable is. So a parable is, is, is a great way to teach. I've, I've asked the Lord several times, give me the gift of teaching in parables because... When you, when you give a parable, a person can hear it at whatever level they are. You can take it down as far as you can go, or you just kind of take it on the surface. So it's a great way to teach. So Jesus taught often in parables. So verse 3, Jesus spoke this parable to them and said, What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors and says to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I have found my sheep which was lost. Then come over to John chapter 6 and verse 37. And Jesus kind of lays it out a little bit different. He says, All that the Father gives me, John chapter 6, verse 37, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. And he says in verse 39, This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing but should raise it up at the last day. Now what I want to teach on this morning, since there's, you know, we're kind of a, just a, family group here this morning, I'm just going to let the cat out of the bag. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I want to teach this morning around the idea that God chose you first. And my thesis is very simple, very simple thesis. The thesis is this, that Jesus presented a loving father who took full responsibility for all of his children to bring them home safely long before Western Christianity morphed God into this judicial deity that has a little bit of a bipolar personality. That's my thesis this morning. You know, the, the thrust of evangelism has been since, well, the 1700s, the days of John Wesley, uh, Jonathan Edwards, George Whitfield, modern, bring it up a little bit, modern day Billy Graham, Evangelism has always centered around the, the same method, the same message, and the same motivation. And we have accepted kind of the way we have done evangelism since the 1700s. And we just kind of thought that's the way evangelism is done without question. I mean, those of us that are sitting here this morning, we cut our teeth on Jonathan Edwards, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, or John Wesley and his messages Billy Graham, they all had a certain style. They all had a certain message that rang pretty much the same. And the message tended to center around this, that God sent Jesus who died on the cross for your sins to save you if you would accept him into your heart as your personal savior. The picture that we drew was kind of like this, that God has done everything that he's going to do. He's done all that he possibly can do. Now the ball is sort of in your court and unless you respond, unless you make a decision, unless you make a choice, that you're going to be lost forever, eternally, separated from God, in eternal conscious torment, and it's not God's fault, it's your fault because of the choice and the decision that you made. In the Western Evangelical Church, we've kind of programmed ourselves and we've kind of taught to trust in the decision that we make for Jesus. And most of us here came up in that culture, and you may still this morning be trusting in the decision that you made for Christ. And kind of what I found over the years is a dependence on the decision that we make for Christ tends to breed more often than not, from one time to the next, a little bit of of insecurity and stress and being unsure of our salvation experience because our lives are, are 
at best inconsistent. And so when you have some of those times that you don't feel close to the Lord or you have messed up in life or you know that you have blown it, in those times you begin to question whether you're even saved or not. And so when you, when you, when you put your trust in your decision, um, you're leaving yourself open to a life that's very much up and down based on how you feel at that present time. It, and we've called that evangelism. Now, when we do evangelism that way, what we've done really is missed entirely the gospel, the good news. The good news is really God's decision and choice of you separate from and apart from your choice and decision for Him. The good news centers around the fact that God, before time, made a decision, made a choice for you. John's Gospel does a great job at at revealing salvation, which is complete wholeness, spirit, soul, and body. And John does a good job of showing us how God initiated by his choice, not our choice, and began to work that plan of salvation, of wholeness and completeness into the human race. And when we can, when we can get fixed within us the supremacy of God's choice over our choice, and we can get that firmly fixed in our thinking, Rather than producing insecurity and, and feeling unsure of our experience, what it does when we can fix within us His choice of us, it produces a lot of peace and rest. I want to give you an example out of John, how John shows us the choice that God made for us apart from the choice we make for Him. Now I'm going to kind of put this... <clears throat> this and I'm going to call it a sacred cow of evangelism on the grill this morning. But rest easy because next Sunday morning what I want to do is talk about evangelism as it should be in the New Testament. So we're going to kind of draw a contrast this week and next week. Evangelism is important. It's very important. But I think we've, we've missed the boat on the importance of what the real message of evangelism is. And we've brought evangelism back to a place where it's dependent on our choice and our decision. And my contention this morning is that real evangelism is a proclamation of the good news, which is God's choice for us. Now let's go over to John chapter 1, and and I want to just show you how the the Bible kind of lays this out. In John chapter 1 and verse 12, it says this, and this this verse uh, has been used typically for a long time as an evangelistic verse. John chapter 1 and verse 12 says, But to as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God to those who believe in his name. Now there's two key words in verse 12 that we have used for evangelism, and the key words are received and believe. We've, we've taught for a long time, we've believed, and, and, and that's been the message, that to as many as receive him, To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to those who believe in his name. Now, those have been that's been a strong evangelism verse. We've used that to show the importance of the receiving and the believing to be a child of God. But what that verse really is getting at, it's getting at growing in him. It's not about birthing in him. Now, watch how watch watch how the verse goes. To as many as receive him, to them gave he power to become. There's the verse is about a becoming, it's not about a birthing. Gave he power to become, and in the New King James, it says to become the children of God. If you have a King James or some of the other versions, it says to become the sons of God. The word son that is used there is the word technon. Technon is not an infant. Technon is not a newborn. Technon is more associated with a child that is about half grown, maybe of of a teenage age, a teenage stature. And the word technon is also used many times in the New Testament to show one who's being mentored. For example, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul is mentoring Timothy and he calls Timothy his Son in the gospel, and the word for son there is the word technot, because Timothy was one that was being mentored by Paul. So 
When we come over to Roman, when we come to John chapter 1 and verse 12, and he says, To as many as received him, to them he gave power to become. The becoming is, is not to be birthed, but to grow in stature. To grow in stature requires a receiving and a believing. A receiving and a believing is a response to the revelation that you see that the Holy Spirit brings you about Jesus. So as you receive, as you see and respond to the revelation and the truth that there is about Jesus, you grow. And as you grow, he uses the word techna to show that it's a, that it's a continuing stature that we, that we grow in as we, as we progress spiritually. Now, if you come to, down to verse 13, it says, Who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but were born of God. So when we put, don't show the slide yet, but when we, when we put verses 12 and 13 together, verse 13 talks about our birthing. In verse 13 it says that we were born, and this is where we come back to the infant or the napios stage, we're born not of, the, uh, uh, not of blood or the will of the flesh nor of the will of man, but we were born of God in verse 13, and then we grow, verse 12, by believing and receiving, there is a stature that we attain to. So if we were to put those two verses together, I'd, I'd just like to, to, to kind of paraphrase it. If we put the two verses together, we might say it like this. Can you go ahead and show me the slide? We might say it like this. To these are given power to become the sons of God. To these are given power to become the sons of God who were born not of the will of the flesh, which is not by independent ego choice, nor of the will of man, not by human desire or decision, but by the will of God, by divine prerogative. Those that he, those that grow, those that are given power to become the sons of God are those that are birthed by the will of God, not by the choice or the will of a man. All right? So the believing and the receiving is important, verse 12. It's how we, it's how we, it's how we continue to develop. But the birthing is a process that we had nothing to do with. It, is, it doesn't come by the... It doesn't come by the will of man nor by the decision of man. It comes, verse 13, by the will of God. Can you see that? So the question is, can the Father birth you through the resurrection from death to life, but you never grow by never responding or believing in what the Holy Spirit shows you about Christ? And the answer is yes, yes, and double yes. You can be birthed, but never grow. And we find that oftentimes in, in the lives of believers. They have been born from death to life through the resurrection by the will of God, but they have never, they have never grown. Verse 12, they have not believed, they've not received, they've not entered into. And Paul, Paul talks about that to Timothy. Come over to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Just hold in there with us today. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 9. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 9 says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. For to this end we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men. That's John chapter 1 and verse 13. He, all men were birthed by the will of God at the resurrection. He is the Savior of all men. But now watch, now watch what Paul tells Timothy especially of those who believe. So believing and receiving does have an advantage over just being birthed. Amen? It's, it's one thing to, to, be, to be birthed, it's another thing to grow. And Paul is telling Th Timothy, we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, but especially of those that are growing, that are receiving and that are believing. So the believing and the receiving is the responding to what takes us then into the fullness of what salvation provides for us. It, what's, it's what, let me say it like this. It, what, it's what takes us into the promised land. There were, there were a lot that left Egypt, that left the bondage, but they never entered the promised land. And the Bible says they didn't enter because of their unbelief. 
Were they, were they qualified to enter? Yes, they were. Should they have entered? I think they probably should have. But because of unbelief, they never enjoyed the milk and honey. There are many today that are birthed by God, but are not enjoying the life that has been provided for us. And the line of distinction is those that are, are believing and receiving and those that are not believing and receiving. See, what we've done with evangelism is this. What, what modern evangelism since the 1700s has done is we have made the game set and match of life getting our ticket punched so we can get to heaven. That's been, that's been what evangelism is about. The Father's game set and match is entirely different than ours. The Father's end game is not, to just, is not to get us to heaven. Matter of fact, God would just like you to relax about this heaven thing. The Father's end game is the unveiling. It is, it is the manifestation of sons that he gave life to and for them to grab heaven with one hand and earth with the other and bring the two in full manifestation. See, our end, our end product is in evangelism has just been to get people to heaven. We get them to pray the prayer. We get them to sign the card. We put another notch on our Bible, and we feel we've got the job done. That is not how God sees evangelism. We'll get into it deeper next week. God sees evangelism as an awakening, as an eye-opening to the fullness of what He provided for us through Christ and then us living in the fullness of that which comes through the receiving and the believing. Now that's, your, that's where you enter into it as the Holy Spirit brings light. See, it was, it was the fathers through the Son's heavy lifting that brought life and immortality to the human race. It was not my decision. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit the Amplified. I kind of went crazy with the Amplified Bible this week. Sometimes I like to change versions now and then. Do you do, ever do that? Just because different... You, after you read one version of the Bible all the time, you think you know everything it says, but when you switch versions, all of a sudden you see things differently. So this week I, I, got, to, I got to reading the Amplified, and I forgot how it really amplifies. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that for a few verses off and on this morning, but look at Romans chapter 9 and verse 16. It was The Father did all the heavy lifting. The Father did the work through the Son to bring the life and the immortality to the human race. And he did that through the resurrection of Jesus. 1 Peter 1.3 says that we were begotten again through the resurrection. So he brought us into new life. And in, and in Romans chapter 9 and verse 16 in the Amplified it says this. So then God's gift is not a question of human will and human effort. So then God's gift is not a question of human will and human effort, but of God's mercy. It depends not on one's own willingness nor his strenuous uh, exertion as running a race, but on God having mercy on him. So it, it, it comes, the gift, whatever the gift is, when you read your Bible and you see this is the gift of God, whatever you see a gift, the gift is not a question of human will and human effort. It comes because of God's mercy. You remember what mercy is? Mercy is not giving us what we deserve. That's what mercy is. So when God extends mercy to us, He doesn't give us what we deserve. He gives us grace, which is giving us what we don't deserve. So mercy and grace work together to, to make a pretty full package of God's goodness to us. On one hand, He doesn't give us what we deserve. And on the other hand, He gives us, he, he gives us what we don't deserve which is favor and benefit, and he doesn't give us what we do, do deserve, sometimes which is harshness, because our Father's not harsh. He's not judicial. He's not mean-spirited. He's a Father that loves you regardless. So I think it's important to understand that God's gift is not a question of human will. If it were a question of human will, we would always be questioning whether we had it. And there are people today that continually question whether they are saved, whether they're in, whether they're out, whether they're favored, whether they're unfavored. And it comes because they have rested their trust on their decision for Christ rather than His decision for us. And so we, we find throughout Scripture the priority is laid on His choosing you. So now, if you can get this fixed in your mind then, I also hit another little translation called the Campbell-Johnson translation. It's not a real well-known translation. 
It, the man has, has passed off of the scene, and I really wanted one, and somebody heard I wanted one, and they found it in a little bookshop in the Midwest, and they actually got it for me. But in the Campbell, Campbell Johnson translation on Romans 9.16, it says this. This is so plain. It says, our relationship to God is not according to our choice or effort, but according to God's decision to relate to us. See, he reconciled us. He chose us. That's the gospel. So now once that, once that becomes a settled issue, then we begin to see that the human race is now in a place where they can settle into who they are and work within the circle of love with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to begin to show this Father that made a choice of us to all of the cosmos, to the entire creation. No longer do we have to worry about choosing Him and pleasing Him and being right with Him. We understand He chose us and made us right with Him so now we can begin to expose this God of love to all of creation. That's the Father's plan and purpose for us. It's not that we strive and work to try to get to heaven. That's been what evangelism is about. God's perspective is that we are secure. We understand that He's chosen us, that He loves us, in fact, I, many of you are experiencing this today. You're experiencing the Father being brought to the forefront as the perfect representation of Jesus. Jesus perfectly represented the Father. Not Moses, not Elijah, not, not, not David, not Isaiah, not Jeremiah. Jesus represented the Father. And He brought that Father to us and revealed him to us. Now, as sons of God that are comfortable knowing that nothing is dependent on our choice and decision, but on his, we can begin to show the same father to all of creation. Amen. Now, once you see the father as the perfect representation in Jesus, now you can begin to see that your completeness is also mirrored in Him and He is the endorsement of your true identity. So this thing begins to work together and it's realizing that God did the choosing of us before time in Christ and when you get that perspective, when that settles down in your heart that God chose you, you're not the exception to the rule this morning. Come on, I know sometimes we get to feeling that way. You know, God might have chose everybody else, but he didn't choose me. He loves everybody else, but he doesn't love me. Everybody else is a recipient of his grace, but man, my life, I'm just not receiving the kind of grace. Once you can get fixed in his mind that he chose you, actually chose you. Look, when that becomes our, that is the starting point. That is the beginning of waking up. That's, that's the start of believing. It's the entryway into the completeness of, of all he has given to us. Man, when you come into this, then this, this, this flow of unending grace that is one way gets stronger, it gets larger, as we see that it's about his choice for us and not our choice for him. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 20, we'll go back to the New King James for just a minute. In Romans chapter 10, 10 and verse 20, it's not about our choice for him. It's about his choice for for us. I want you to feel chosen this morning. I want you to feel secure. I want you to feel at peace this morning. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 20, it says, Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. I bet if you look back at your own life, your own experience with Christ, you would have to say that he probably showed up when you least expected it. He began to show himself to you when, when he might have not even been in your thinking. This shows, this shows God's willingness to come to us. You're not a God chaser this morning. You're a God recipient. And then we find in John chapter 7, verse 36, Jesus kind of says somewhat the same thing. In John chapter 7 and verse 36, he said, what is this thing that he said, you will seek me and not find me? 
And where I am, you cannot come. Jesus is saying very boldly that coming to Him, trying to find Him by our seeking, trying to find Him by our chasing is, is beyond our capacity to choose. It's above our pay grade. We, we need Him to come to us. And He has. The point that is lost in the perverted gospel is that the sheep never return to the flock of their own will. Never. Je Jesus, we read it in, in, in Luke this morning, in Luke 15, the sheep never find their way themselves back to the flock. Matter of fact, the sheep don't even know they're lost. They have no clue they're lost but they are sought after, they're pursued, they are found, they are returned by the good shepherd. Now listen, how we've kind of viewed that parable in evangelism is there are good sheep and bad sheep. The bad sheep wandered off and got lost. The good sheep didn't wander off and stayed by the shepherd. But I want you to notice in the parable, there's no good sheep, there's no bad sheep, there's only the good shepherd. Amen? So it was the shepherd's initiative. It was the shepherd's love that went to the sheep and brought the sheep back. It was not, it was not the work of the sheep to come back to the shepherd. The shepherd's initiative and love for the sheep, not the sheep's love for the shepherd, that eventually brought the fold back to the hundred that it needed to be to complete it. All right, now here's a major religious adjustment we're going to have to make. Religious doctrine promotes the supremacy of man's will by teaching that you are not God's offspring until man chooses to believe in God and decides to come to Him, and we've called that evangelism. We've taught and promoted the idea that we are not God's offspring. We're not naturally God's offspring until we choose to believe in God and decide to come to Him. And that's what the message of evangelism is about. Come to Him that He might find you. And I think we've taken the words of Jesus that you are of your father the devil. And we've taken those words to mean that unbelievers are actually the offspring of Satan and belong to Him. The religious idea of adoption is that an unbeliever must be convinced to renounce their satanic ancestry and ask God to adopt them into his family. And when they do that, then God accepts them on the basis and condition that they become a good Christian. And yet we find in Scripture time after time where every human being is claimed as God's offspring. Time after time. Listen, you were never... The devil's possession. Terry's not here, so I'm going to say it. Can you give me a hearty amen? amen. You were never the devil's pos possession. You were, never, you were never given birth by the devil. You were never placed in a demonic family. I mean, come on. Do you honestly think that God created us, the pinnacle of creation, stamps us with his image and his likeness and calls us very good and then hands us over to a force of evil and stands back and allows even one of us to ever be destroyed. Now spiritually speaking, some of us might have gotten into the car with the stranger who offered us some candy. Spiritually speaking, we might, have, we might have bought into that and jumped in the car because the devil offered us some candy. But the car had a tracking device. And God knew everywhere that the car went. And he never released ownership, nor did he ever release fatherhood. He never did. In fact, the Bible says, the Bible says that it's in him and I want to take this whole passage next week in Acts chapter 17 because it's a great pattern of New Testament evangelism. Paul speaking to a, a bunch of real pagans said it's in him we live and move and have our being. 
God never relinquished fatherhood. He never relinquished ownership. In, in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 6, it says this. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 6, that there's one God and Father of all. There is one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. In other words, God transcends everything is what that verse is saying. God transcends it all, and yet He's within all. And then we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 6. Yet for us there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for Him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. Now here's the problem, verse 7. However, there is not in everyone that knowledge. That's the sticker right there. There is one God and Father of all, who's above all, through all, and in all, but the problem is not everyone has that knowledge. But the truth this morning, body of Christ, is that God has claimed ownership of us, He's claimed fatherhood of us, and He's not relinquishing it. Now, what you, notice, you notice that there's several times in verse... Come back to verse 6. Because in the verse that we read, there's the word all used several times, and we've hammered on that and kind of joked around with it and said, you know, all means all. Yet religious tutoring has qualified the word all to mean only all believers. And that's where evangelism is come in. It's, it's separate. It means all... We've, we've taken that word to mean rather than all. We've just we've narrowed it down to only mean all Believers, those that made a choice, those that made a decision. So many are convinced that God is only, that God's not the father of all. He's only the father of all believers. Folks, that's the lie. That's the root of the lie of separation. Can you see that? We've said, okay, you got this group over here. You're in the devil's family. And you all over here, you're in God's family. And... Well, you got them and us. And you got them over there and, 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 and us over here. And there's separation not only between us, but because we're in God's family, then these poor people over here are outside. You see the separation. You can't, you can't preach an inclusive message with that kind of separation. And when you're over here in God's family, you look at, you look at that group, and you were, you were taught that those people were born with an edemic nature. They were born fallen, totally depraved, spiritually blind, with a propensity to make bad choices and decisions. And in that situation, they're supposed to make a good choice to come to Jesus. And if in a fallen, depraved alienated, blinded position, which is what we felt this group over here had, they didn't make the right choice and the right decision with the, with the deck totally stacked against them. Do you see how we stack the deck against them totally? You got an endemic nature, you're depraved, you're totally separated from God, you're the child of the devil, but you better make a good choice. That's pretty well having a stacked deck the deck stacked against you to try to make the good choice. The good news is that you were chosen. The choice was made for you in the one predestined man. Jesus was the predestined one. The Bible says that we have been pre, he predestined us by Jesus. So whatever happened to Jesus happened to everybody. He was our guy. It was like David. When David went out to fight the Philistine, remember all of Israel stood back? They stood on the hillside and they watched the battle. David, whatever happened to David happened to all of Israel. If, Israel, if David defeated Goliath, they were all free. If David was defeated, they were all captive. David was the Savior, a picture, type of, shadow of. When we look at Jesus, we see the one that represented all of us. He, he, whatever happened to him, happened to us. I mean, God works his plan. The Bible says, 
according to the good pleasure of his will. He works his plan according to the good pleasure of his will. His choice, his choosing. Now I'm going to come back to, 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 the, to the Amplified for just a minute. Come over to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. If you want to read it out, out of whatever you got, that's fine. But let me just read this out of the Amplified. Oh my, I know this is a little contrary to what maybe we, you have been accustomed to in, in the idea of evangelism, but I want us to get down in our minds this morning how much God has made a choice of us and our choosing Him as a response to the choice that He's already made of you and me. All right, in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 5, it says, For He foreordained us, destined us, planned in love for us, to be adopted, revealed as his own children through Christ, through Jesus Christ, in accordance with the purpose of his will, because it pleased him and what it was his kind intent. Isn't that amazing? I mean, God chose you, knowing everything about you, knowing every decision you would make, every sin you'd ever commit, every bad, every bad turn in life that you would take, every foul up, every screw up. And he still looks at you and says, I chose you in Christ before time. If he's willing to choose you under those circumstances, do you think you could ever unchoose you? Come back over a little bit to the left. Look at this. You're not going to unchoose you. Romans chapter 11, verse 29. It says, For God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. God's gifts and his call. Gifts, plural, call, singular. He's got one call. He's called all of us by Christ to himself. That call is irrevocable. Now all of the gifts, when you go through the Bible, you see all the gifts that are mentioned, not just gifts of the Spirit, but you know the gift of salvation, gift of healing, whatever gift, you see there's a gift. His gifts and his call are irrevocable. He never withdraws them when once they are given. And he does not change his mind about those to whom he gives. To whom he gives his grace or to whom he sends his call. See, God's gifts, God's plan, God's call, God's will have all been, you know, I want you to, like, like your check at the bank, direct deposited into your life. You don't, you don't even know when the check hits. It's just there. You might know your check comes in on Thursday, but you don't know whether it's 9 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 2 o'clock. It's just automatically deposited. The gifts and the call of God are irrevocable. He has direct deposited them into your life. So you just go over on the computer, your Bible, and you look at it, and you see, yeah, there they are. He has given them to us. He's direct deposited, and, he, and, and what we just read is he will not rescind or take back any of them. So the sin, the disobedience, the straying away, trying to do it on our own, our failures, thank God this morning they never changed his mind about us. He doesn't take them back. You are not God's exception that he pulled out of the grace mix. You look at other people, you say, God loves them, but I don't know if he loves me. They have grace. I don't know that if I do. It's a lot deeper than this, but let's just visualize. You rode the coattails of Jesus to the cross, to the grave, to the resurrection, to the right hand of the Father, and to the judgment of Jesus, which was righteous in everything. You rode his coattails the whole way. In fact, while you're in, 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 the Amplified, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30. It says, but it is from Him that you have your life in Christ Jesus. It is from Him that you have your life in Christ Jesus. Whom God made our wisdom from God, revealed to us the knowledge of the divine plan of salvation, previously hidden, manifesting itself as our righteousness, thus making us upright and putting us in right standing with God in our consecration, making us pure and holy in our redemption, providing our ransom from eternal penalty for sin. So then as it is written, let him who boasts and proudly rejoices and glorifies boasts and proudly rejoices 
Let him do it in the Lord. See, you don't have to proudly rejoice and boast in your decision anymore. You can proudly boast in his decision for you. Amen? All right. I know you missed an hour of sleep, so I'm going to cut to the chase. Bottom line, here it is. Our choosing him is nothing more than our recognizing the fact that he chose us from eternity past to eternity future and beyond. All right? Your decision for him is basically no longer resisting his choice of you. Our choice then in this whole thing, our choice is this. It's to surrender to the fact that we were chosen before we were born and surrendering to that choice. Let me tell you how strong his choice is of you. You're never going to get out of it. You cannot get out of it. His love is inescapable. In fact, there's a, there's, a, there's a book you really should read. It's by a guy named Dr. Thomas Talbot. It's called The Inescapable Love of God. It'll change, it'll change, your, it'll change your world. He's a professor at an Ivy League school. It's called The Inescapable Love of God. You cannot escape it. His, his choice is so strong that you're not getting out of it. In fact, the Bible says this, that if we are totally faithless, have absolutely no faith whatsoever, he remains faithful. You say, where's that in the Bible? 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. I thank God this morning, and we need to rejoice. This is, this is, the, this is the gospel. This is the good news. This is what you need to tell people. The Father will never deny that he's your father, nor will he ever refute that you're his offspring. Never refute that. So that awareness, if, if we can get the world to understand that he will never deny that he is their father, nor will he ever refute that they are his offspring, that awareness is the reality that enables us to come to faith and participate in the fullness of salvation. That's what gives us the peace and the security. Now, I realized this morning I kind of put the traditional sacred cow of evangelism on the grill. So I want to make up for it next week. Next week I want to teach on what New Testament evangelism should look like. Because it's important. Evangelism is important. There are, there's a world full of people out there that need to see Jesus. Amen? But there's a way that they need to see Him. They need to encounter Him. I want you to take Acts chapter 17, verses 16 to 34. That's your reading assignment. Acts chapter 17, verses 16 through 34. And I want you to ponder what Paul, how Paul dealt with those heathens. I just want you to look at the pattern of how Paul brought them the good news. And I want you to compare. There, there's a reason. Look up here just a minute. There's a reason why you always felt weird telling people about Jesus. Anybody ever feel that but me? Like you're sitting in a plane next to somebody and you say, I really should tell them about Jesus. What do I do? And you feel strange about it. There's a reason for that. Presenting the gospel should be as easy as falling off a log. It should be a natural flow of our life. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be something where we feel squeamish about or feel weird. And when we hit it in that New Testament pattern, I think you're going to see an entirely different, different light on how we present the gospel in a way that we can do it that is natural. It should be a natural presentation of the life that you have within. Amen? All right. So, you're God's choice. He's never going to rescind your, your childhood. He's never going to pull himself off being your father. That's a done deal. It's settled. Now receive and believe and grow in Jesus' name. Amen?